3, 2, unité, top. And we have engine start. And lift off. Décollage. Décollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. On Christmas Day 2021, an Ariane 5 rocket launched the James Webb Space Telescope and it arrived at its destination in January of 2022, a solar orbit near the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange point, approximately 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. This was a unique and bold deployment because the Hubble Space Telescope was deployed in low Earth orbit where repairs could be carried out if needed, and as most of us know, that had to be done with Hubble, but with James Webb, there was no such luxury available. Out at this location, which by the way is sort of a parking lot between the Sun and Earth where gravity is essentially nullified between the two bodies, meaning that anything parked there would remain there with minimal course corrections needed and therefore very little propellant required in order to keep it in place, well, if anything happened to it out this far, it would be a multi-billion dollar write-off. But James Webb fortunately was not a write-off, and it has revealed some amazing discoveries from throughout the cosmos. But one of the most significant discoveries that was promised to us from the James Webb developers was the ability of this telescope to give us detailed atmospheric characterizations of potentially habitable exoplanets. In other words, this telescope should be able to pick up biosignatures, gases in planetary atmospheres that can only be produced by biological processes. And apparently, James Webb has finally found these gases. Or, to be more precise, James Webb has confirmed a previous discovery of a biosignature gas, something that can only be produced by living organisms. And according to a team at Cambridge University, they found so much of this biosignature gas on an enormous planet very unlike Earth. It suggests that this planet must be teeming with life, life that is very different from the life that we know here on Earth. Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to the Angry Astronaut, and here we go again. But before we get to that, going to catch you up real quick on what's been going on with me and the channel. Traveled out to South Carolina and just got back to Colorado after visiting my son and uh, watching his jazz ensemble performance at Clemson University. Go there twice a year to watch that. Really just a very enjoyable thing. So got an opportunity to see him again, which I always value. I'm going to be here in Colorado for a few more weeks until I return to the United Kingdom and uh, going to try to get some things accomplished while I'm out here, perhaps going down to New Mexico. I have an invitation uh, to tour Spaceport America. Got that opportunity when I was at the Space a space symposium and then also heading out to Washington DC to uh, check out some information in the National Archives regarding a CIA sighting of UFOs in the 1950s and there's some footage associated with that that after all this time is yet to be digitized it's available to the public they just haven't digitized it and put it online I'd really like to see it and you guys have been supporting that I'm almost up to my goal Goal. I only need about another hundred dollars and I'll have what I need to go out to DC to pay for the hotel and the plane ticket, etc., to go to the National Archives and get all of that for you. Okay, so now that we've covered all that, let's go ahead and talk about the James Webb Space Telescope and the most recent discoveries that have been made. A team at Cambridge University have discovered, or at least they say that they have discovered, they have a high degree of confidence on this, the presence of two different chemicals in the atmosphere of a relatively nearby planet that can only be produced by biological processes. As far as we know, there is no abiotic process that creates these types of chemicals.
chemicals. We have found them nowhere else in the solar system, in our solar system anyway, except in the atmosphere of our own planet. So therefore, it would appear that we have what is called a biosignature here, a clear sign of the presence of life. But of course, this is being disputed by a number of other folks who are in the astrobiology field, people who are allegedly looking for life throughout the cosmos. But in my opinion, all they're doing is looking for reasons to argue that there is no life in the cosmos except for here on Earth, because every time a discovery is made, these folks seem to do everything they can to refute the discovery rather than try to find more information to support it. Hey, I just blinked. How about that? A lot of folks have been uh, noticing that I don't blink on camera. I have no idea how to explain that. All I know is that uh, when I'm talking to someone or, or trying to make a point, I guess I don't blink, look straight into their eye and, and don't blink. And, and I think that just makes me seem more credible. I don't know. It's not intentional. It's just something I do. But let's get back to the topic. So, what really has been discovered here? How certain is this team in Cambridge and why do we have the difference of opinion? Because this is a very, very big deal if indeed these chemicals have been discovered because it indicates that life can exist on planets that are actually very, very different from our own even though this is a planet that exists within the habitable zone of its star. That's about the only similarity that exists with this world. It's not the same size as Earth. It doesn't even have the same kind of atmosphere. It may have similar temperatures and the presence of liquid water, but that's about it. There's no planet like this one in our own solar system. We are even unaware of the possibility of these kinds of planets existing 20 years ago. They are called Hycean worlds, water worlds. And if there is indeed life on this planet, it means that life could be widespread, diverse, and very different from the kinds of life we have here on Earth. This is the planet known as K218b, although to be honest, we're not really certain exactly what this planet looks like. This is just a speculation as to what it might look like if it is indeed a Hycean world. What is a Hycean world, by the way? Well, it's a planet that doesn't exist in our own solar system, but rather an hypothesized world that has a large global ocean beneath a thick hydrogen-rich atmosphere. In other words, not a breathable atmosphere by our standards. Larger than Earth, but smaller than Neptune, fitting into what's called a super-Earth category. The combination of a huge planet-wide ocean as deep as a thousand kilometers and a hydrogen-rich atmosphere is what gives it its name, a high Cian world, which is a combination, obviously, of hydrogen and ocean. Now, recent research suggests that this is is not the only example of Hycean worlds that James Webb has locked in on. In addition, there's an exoplanet called TOI-270d that also appears to be a likely Hycean world. Although, to be fair, it is the same team at Cambridge that has come to this type of conclusion. The data from Webb suggests that the atmosphere of the planet contains water vapor, methane, and carbon dioxide, which is consistent with an atmosphere that is predominantly hydrogen with a global water ocean beneath it. There's also a lack of ammonia, which is also consistent with a Hycean ocean world scenario. And the most tantalizing thing of all, possible signatures of carbon disulfide were also found in this planet's atmosphere, which are consistent with biological processes. There is no process on Earth, at least no processes that we are aware of, that can produce this type of chemical 
other than biological processes. However, this recent discovery on K218B is the most promising discovery of all because it's not the first detection of this particular chemical, but rather the confirmation of its presence after further analysis. And that is a very big deal indeed. And it's a different chemical than the one that's present in the atmosphere of TOI 270D. Instead, the University of Cambridge team detected traces of dimethyl sulfide and dimethyl disulfide in the planet's atmosphere. On Earth, these compounds are definitely only produced by microbial life such as phytoplankton. The scientists, however, admit that there's a possibility that these substances have been produced on the planet by an unknown chemical process unrelated to microorganisms. However, if that is indeed the case, we have never detected these chemicals anywhere else in the solar system, nor have we found them on other planets. This is a very unique discovery that only exists side by side with the existence of widespread life. However, they emphasize that this data represents the strongest evidence to date for possible life on a planet other than our own. Their information was published in a peer-reviewed paper in the scientific journal, the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Again, K218b is 8.6 times the mass of Earth, much different than our planet, nearly three times its size. It lies in the direction of the constellation Leo and orbits a small, low-temperature type of star called a red dwarf. The planet is very close to its star. It only takes 33 days to complete one orbit, but due to the red dwarf's low temperature, the planet is in a region of space that, in theory, allows liquid water to exist on its surface. And by the way, water has been detected in this planet's atmosphere in the past. Now, as I said before, this is not the first time that K218b has caught the attention of astronomers. In 2023, the same team of scientists found methane and carbon dioxide in its atmosphere and also identified diffuse signals that at the time looked like they might be dimethyl sulfide. And so two years later, the team took another look at the promising planet and this is when they found the confirmation that they were looking for. Let's go ahead and have a look at the press release that came from the Cambridge team. Quote, using data from the James Webb Space Telescope, the astronomers led by University of Cambridge have detected the chemical fingerprints of dimethyl sulfide, DMS, and or dimethyl disulfide, DMDS, in the atmosphere of the exoplanet K218b, which orbits its star in its habitable zone. And on Earth, DMS and DMDS are only produced by life, primarily microbial life such as marine phytoplankton. The observations have reached the three sigma level of statistical significance, meaning there is a 0.3% probability that they occurred by chance. To reach the accepted classification for scientific discovery, the observations would have to cross the five sigma threshold, meaning that they would be below a 0.00006% probability that they occurred by chance. The researchers say that between six and 24 hours hours of follow-up observation time with JWST may help them reach the all-important Five Sigma significance. But unsurprisingly, astrobiologists across the planet are questioning these results. For one thing, their work suggests the concentration of these gases in the planet's atmosphere is thousands of times higher than the concentration here on Earth. That being the case, this planet must be absolutely teeming with life. However, if you consider also that it has a massive ocean a thousand kilometers thick, at least that's what the models suggest, then it would stand to reason that there would be a lot more life on this planet than we would have on our own. Something that some people just may not be all that quick to accept. Still, everyone is talking about the old adage that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, although I like to think what these people 
people really want is unattainable evidence, evidence that we will never be able to find. But if we want more evidence, then why doesn't NASA and ESA just grant this team the extra observation time on James Webb that they're asking for to provide further confirmation of what they've already confirmed and reach that Five Sigma level of certainty? So what sort of conclusions should we draw from this? Well, here's the deal. I don't think that this team at Cambridge is full of quacks or people who are quick to judge, people who are quick to make declarations about their discoveries or anything like that. I think they've done a hell of a lot of work to prove what they feel that they have discovered. They need a little bit more time on the James Webb Space Telescope in order to bring this discovery to a further level of confirmation. But we are already looking at a greater than 99% certainty that they have found these chemicals in the atmosphere, that life almost certainly exists on this planet. One would think that those responsible for James Webb, that European Space Agency and NASA would do everything they could to grant as much telescope time as possible to this team and to others who perhaps want to refute their arguments in order to confirm or deny the existence of life on this world. So why aren't they doing it? Why aren't they giving this team an extreme amount of priority? Isn't there anything more exciting than the prospect of confirming the existence of life on worlds aside from our own? Well, maybe not. Because James Webb has dedicated a hell of a lot more time towards trying to understand the origins of the universe to peer back almost to the moment of the Big Bang rather than confirming the existence of life in the universe. Because if one confirms that we are not alone, what other conclusions can we draw from that? What other discoveries can possibly be made? It's not like we can learn a whole lot about exactly what kind of life exists there to learn about the ecosystems and the ecology of this planet. It's just too far away, and there's only so much that James Webb can learn at this kind of distance. And if we were to dispatch a probe to this planet, it would take centuries, if not millennia, to arrive. So really, how much bang for your buck is James Webb going to get by looking for life in the universe as opposed to other things? And is this the reason that NASA and ESA have not really assigned a great deal of priority to this particular line of discovery? Could it be that the discovery of life in the universe is not nearly as exciting as we might think? And even though it might be exciting to people like you and me, to the scientists who are actually behind James Webb and trying to justify its existence, justify the billions of dollars that was spent on it. If they discover life, then what else do they have to discover? How can they justify the investment that was made? Well, discovering life certainly would be a huge, huge discovery. But then after that, where do you go? Wouldn't it be better to focus on things that we can learn more about, learn more about the origins of the universe, what the universe was like in its early days, how galaxies evolved in the first one to 200 million years after the Big Bang. All that may not be all that exciting to the average person, not even that tremendously exciting to me compared to the possibility of life existing in the universe. But once again, we can learn a lot more about those things with James Webb than we can learn about the exact disposition, the exact kinds of life that might exist on faraway worlds. And is that the reason that NASA is not affording a lot of telescope time to these teams? Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal. As I say, I want to get out to the National Archives very close to that goal right now. All the details in the description. Thanks again. And as always, stay angry about space.